Uh, well, <laughs> so I, I felt I felt like I knew rowing well enough to to kind of be fine with that side. It was really learning the, I guess when you leave mid-season or right before the season, recruiting really takes a hit. So it was really getting the the recruits back into the play, kind of talking to me and seeing if they want to come. So biggest you know amount of work was getting recruiting back to the to the stable spot, getting fundraising back because obviously your donors are now kind of like pissed off a little bit for sure. So and there's this new guy who nobody knows who he is taking over the team, right? And it was a really uncertain time for me as well because I quit my job to take to go back into coaching, which is a huge, you know, career risk. And then at, at that time, I know the school wanted to hire somebody else, right? There was, you know, obviously, who is Evo? We have to look for a new coach, whatever. So luckily for me, it was right before the season started. So there was not enough time. And, and at that time, you know, there was no coaches available, really. And if anybody was available in February, I mean, there was a reason they were. So they didn't really want to rush the process. So. I was kind of given the green light to proceed and, and run the team for for the season, which was awesome because we went on to have our best season ever um, as, as a team. We um... What's up, everybody? It's Rowing Cast, episode 11 with coach Ivo Krakic. How are you doing today, brother? Doing great, doing great. Excited to be here. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Uh, coach Ivo, he is the coach at LaSalle in Philadelphia. And today we're going to talk to him about the sport of rowing, how he got into the sport. Um, he rode in the States. He rode for Drexel. We'll talk about his time there. He rode on his national team. We'll talk about all of that. And then he transitioned. Um, you probably one of the youngest coaches I've ever, you know, seen in the sport of rowing at, you know, in this point and, you know, transitioning to building LaSalle into a prominent Philadelphia, you know, team you know philadelphia is a big uh you know city for the sport of rowing so for lasalle to just come back it, it's it's pretty cool to see so i just had to give you your flowers before we even start <laughs> thank you thank you of course of course so let's talk about it ivo let's talk about how'd you get into the sport of rowing uh so it's, it's kind of a funny story uh so i was a, i was a chubby kid you know i loved playing video games and all that and, and we barely ever go outside uh so my mom drove down past this lake Yarun in Zagreb and saw a bunch of guys carrying boats down to the dock and rowing and so she comes home and says look I don't care if you row or not but just carry the damn boat and come home so at least you know get out of the house so I I was like all right sure if you're gonna get off my you know back and just let me do my thing so I'll go carry the boat come back home and do my you know do my thing so I go there and so as a chubby kid, when you do sports, generally coaches aren't super excited, especially for like soccer. I would always be a goalkeeper. So I didn't really you know, like that. I was kind of a taller kid. So in basketball, I would play center, but I really didn't like basketball. So I was kind of, you know, moving around different sports. So I get to the boathouse and the first thing coach says, holy crap, you're so big. You're going to be the best guy here. You know, so they were super excited <clears throat> about my size, which was the first time ever somebody was excited about me being big. Uh, and so that's kind of how I fell in love with it. So I. I stayed, I actually rode, I didn't just carry the boat and kind of the rest is history. Very sweet, very sweet. What time period yeah, I like was that, I like you? that entry. I like <laughs> that entry because, you know, we're talking about, you know, just seeing uh, some work being done and that's what, you know, we're always all about. Uh, just putting in that hard work, whether it's carrying the boats, you know, obviously putting in some good strokes, getting to regattas, it's all about that heavy lifting. So I love that's how your entry point. Yeah, and this is, I was, uh, I was like seven, or eight years old at that point. So I started off really, really early. That's pretty sweet. So um, starting out that early, what was the mindset of rowing? Was it, are you going out for a recreational row? Is it technical? Are you racing? What did that look like? Well, I think uh, the coaches did a really good job of like making you fall in love with the sport. I think initially it was just kind of learning the the ropes, kind of learning the boats, getting into the boat, all that jazz as you would start as a as a normal walk on. Or, uh, but then as as we went through, and you know, I noticed that I was actually pretty good at this. You know, with my size, Eric's were obviously pretty good. Uh, and then we had, you know, it was like a smaller. It's a club based sport in, in Croatia, and, and we had a smaller group. But then looking at you know, part of my club was Damir Martin and then going through and seeing kind of the records that he had at my age and kind of how close or was I beating them was kind of like inspirational because this guy's an Olympian 
and here I am kind of pretty much following his trajectory going forward throughout the the years so it was pretty cool to see that and almost like it, it kept me in a sport you know kept me wanting to kind of see how far I can take it that's pretty sweet that's pretty sweet so let's talk about that can you explain just a little bit you know um what is the club system like you know uh for you for in in, in your system so, so in Croatia it's all club based so um there is no college or high school rowing at all uh i mean there is some college rowing but it's pretty sp sp you know sparse it doesn't really exist as much as it is here it's not developed uh so it's, it's essentially all clubs so you have to join a club and typically you join between ages of 12 and 14 and you go through age groups so uh you have 12 to 14 then 14 to 16 then 16 to 18 those are your uh, we call it cadet junior b and then junior a which is your under 19 and then you're going to the u23 so senior b and then senior a which is your elite or uh, top level um so yeah there was about i think uh i want to say eight clubs in zagreb where i'm from and then we have a lot of clubs around on the shore and kind of inland uh and we meet up every weekend throughout the season to race at different cities in croatia so it's a pretty cool as a kid it's a cool experience to travel all around your country, meeting other people, racing. And then as you get older, you race international in Europe, obviously. Blood Regatta is a big one. Munich's a big one. Croatia Open's a big one. So there's a lot of places that we traveled throughout the, the Europe as well as kids. So it's a pretty cool experience being a part of a club and then getting better, getting into the national team and traveling all around uh, to race. So um, what metric did you hit that uh you know in your club that you saw that demir hit that was like okay you know i actually you know i'm i'm actually kind of you know I, I, I'm on track. I think we had uh we had a bunch of 1k tests when i was a little kid and i did really well in those that was like when i was 10 right and then once i got to i think 14 i broke seven or something like that i went like 650 and i think at that point and when he was 14 he went something like that and so coaches were all super excited. Lo, holy, you know, we have this kid who's now following Damir's speed level. Um, and Damir is now, you know, that's that's the age almost when he was getting into the Olympics and in a in a quad. So I think it was it was breaking seven at like 13, 14, uh, was kind of where that level was for him as well. So was breaking these uh times like the big uh push for you uh and the love for the sport? Was there anything else that like got you hooked at that young age? Uh, I think times were the the least, to be honest. I think it was just the the friendships and the kids and and rowing on the water. You know, we had in my club, we had about eighty kids my age, uh, around ten to twelve, that would join. Uh, so the way it works is you'd have coaches go to every single elementary school in Zagreb and and around and join the PE class. So they would bring in her to a PE class and then have you do a hundred meter all out, you know, erg. And then they would kind of try and make you excited about the sport. And then all of the kids would join the club and then see how it goes. So we'd have, you know, we I started with like over 100 kids in my group. And then as we went older, they kind of cut down to like 20, 30. But all those guys are, you know, still very, very, very good friends of mine, like almost my brothers, even though I haven't seen them in person for over, a ten, over 10 years now. So um, on a junior level, did you make the Croatian you know, junior national team? Yes. Yeah, I made the national team in 2013, I want to say. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, we raced at uh, Europeans and World Championships. And what was your experience like there? I mean, I, you probably are, were already like traveling around to have like those type of regattas. But what did it feel like to represent your country? Uh, I mean, that's that's the most special thing in sport, I think, uh, especially for Croatians, because we're very uh, passionate people. Uh, so making it uh, was a dream come true, to be honest with you. And uh, racing those races was the easiest thing ever. I think the the biggest thing or, or the hardest thing is making it. And all of the pressure is on, hey, let's make the boat. Let's go fast. Make sure nobody else beats you from, you know, like from the club or the other clubs. And then once you make it, it's like all stress goes out and you're just getting there going there to enjoy it enjoy racing and to race and go fast and it was funny because at worlds you actually raced us <laughs> uh like three times you had him heat semis and finals and uh, i mean they're beating him in a final but it was always always a close race with them and i, th I think a couple of those guys went to stanford and then i raced them as ed drexel i raced stanford and i think we beat them uh once as well so it was kind of a cool little development
Um, so I was gonna say, um, uh, what boats were you like competing in during uh, you know your junior level? Uh, so the recreation creation system is is based. It's all small boats to develop and to get into the bigger boats. So I spent from ages eight to sixteen a lot of time in singles, doubles, and then eventually quads. And then at sixteen, you're allowed to sweep. So at sixteen, I was sixteen essentially forward. After that, I was in a pair. Uh, so I spent a lot a lot of time in a pair. I raced a lot in the pair with my with my partner. And then for worlds and Europeans, uh, we were second pair in Croatia and we ended up pairing with the third pair to make a straight four. The top pair went as a pair to, to worlds. Makes sense, makes sense. So then at what point were you thinking about going to the States to row? Uh honestly not until pretty late. Um I was never really thinking about states. It's not as common for Croatians to really go. Um, there was a friend of mine that I wrote with who uh, really wanted to go. He was really all about it. And then uh, him talking to me about it for almost a year made me kind of look into it. And I was like, you know what? I could actually do this. So he unfortunately didn't end up going. I think he stopped rowing right before his kind of senior year. But uh, I ended up reaching out to, there was a creation guy at Drexel uh, to kind of help me out with the process and all of that. And that's kind of how it all, started rolling and i ended up at drexel but uh yeah not until i was i think you know uh pretty close to 17 years old which i actually started thinking about going to states to row and, and going to college here i think i've seen that a lot especially you know like just being in the collegiate rowing scene for the time i've been in uh if you have like a friend or someone that was in the club or someone that's local and you're not from the states that's usually how i'm not saying that's like directly how recruiting goes but you kind of feel more comfortable when you see someone that like you know like oh, okay yeah he might be a few years older than me but i clearly remember him rowing around and now yeah okay I, if he could do it i could definitely do it so uh that's interesting i seem to always hear that type of story so it's pretty cool um was there any other schools besides the drexel I was talking to a bunch, to be honest. I think uh, talking to Udap for a while. Uh, Luke McGee was there actually at the time. Uh, I spoke with Northeastern, Drexel, Temple. Uh, I forget. There was there was there was a good amount because once you get your name out there, I think people just want to reach out to get to know you, as recruits should. Um, but yeah, so there there was a bunch, uh, and actually there was a creation guy at Udap, which is why I reached out to them. And I kinda, there was a couple at Northeastern as well. So kind of. It does work out where it's like you're trying to see who of your friends or people that you know is it or is it th at those schools because that is is very helpful as a you know international freshman moving continents it's it, it is a scary thing to just be like on your own so having somebody there that you know is is very helpful yeah and well what was the experience like coming here for, uh, straight from the states just um you know having no uh what was the culture shock like what was that all like for you so the culture is not as as different, which was good. Uh, Croatia is very much westernized with uh, you know the movies and TVs and all that. You know we learn, we take English. I took English in kindergarten, so I was kind of pretty uh, in the know with all of the stuff U.S. almost as much as I could be. Uh, the difference is really the the schooling system is different. Uh, obviously the everything you're kind of more on your own here. Uh, Croatia is, is a lot more like social. It's not a social country, but it's it's there's a lot more social systems to help you you kind of feel like here it's like okay finances are on your own medical stuff is on your own especially as a kid coming in i'm like well i don't have medical insurance like what do i do you know i'm sick what do i do do i have to pay a million dollars to go to the hospital so you don't know these things which you kind of slowly learn as you go through uh the years but you know that was the biggest shock which is kind of being way more on your own which makes sense because you're here without you know no parents or anything but just getting used to that feeling of, hey, I need to rely on some other people and be more in the more kind of independent really was the, the biggest shock. And I guess uh, was rowing like one of your only true like anchors in terms of, uh, you know, back from Croatia to here? Yeah, yeah, I was I was a very much uh, uh, rowing nothing else type of guy. Uh, so I was I was in love with the sport. Uh, that's all I could think of and do uh, to the point where people you know would would make fun of me for it but i honestly like that was my sport that's what i 
you know, I was good at it. I loved doing it and uh, I was all about it. So yeah, that was definitely anchor and something to uh, kind of use as my outlet in a lot of times, so. So tell me, man, what is it like to be a Drexel Dragon? I mean, you're a former Drexel Dragon now. You know, you you're repping, you know, a new squad, the Explorers. But uh, what what was it like? You know, what was it like? Uh, you guys had a pretty. This is like, you know, real like, you know, you guys were cooking essentially in the times that you were at Drexel. Any like highlights? Anything that like offhand? Any practices that that comes to mind? Anything like that? Yeah, so uh, I'm still, I'm I'm at LaSalle now. It's still blue and gold though, so I'm keeping with the with the colors at least. Uh, no, Drexel has been uh, an amazing experience. I'll say that. I think I came in right after they won Dead Wales for the first time, so 2013 May they won. And then I came in the fall, and then that fall we won Charles. Uh, so as a freshman, I was in a varsity eight, and so winning Charles was a huge, uh, probably one of the biggest things still that I did at Drexel, uh, which it was awesome. And then as through, throughout my years, I spent all four years in a V8. And then at Vales, we finished fourth, third, second, and then first. So it took us four years to, to repeat again. But I want, I'd want like to think that we kind of built the culture and the team and the foundation to where it is now. So I think that, you know, I look at my four years at Drexel as really the building years and, and you know, really trying hard to leave the, the you know the team in a much better spot than what it was when I came in. Even though it was in a, it wasn't in a bad spot, but I think overall culture-wise, it did really improve and change throughout my four years. Um, obviously, I rode with Justin Best at Drexel, who just uh, won gold in Olympics. So I'm, I'm super proud for uh, and excited for him. The, you know, he real out of anybody that I know. I mean, he deserves it so much. The guy's like, if I say I'm crazy and love rowing, this guy's like on another level. He's so passionate about the sport. I've never seen it in anybody else. So. Obviously, dragons, you know, go dragons, go Justin. But yeah, no, Drexel has been an amazing experience. I uh, would not change anything there. I think uh, we built something great. Obviously, they're now uh, doing even better. And I'm here to try and spoil that party, hopefully soon. And I think that's, uh, you know, yet without a doubt, this is after, or this is during the Olympics, but this is after the men's four. The USA got the goal. Shout out Justin Best, man. Yep. And shout out to him, man. Uh, but I was going to say, uh, for your time at Drexel, you guys had really great racing. Like you guys had some great schedules. You guys, mm -hmm. and and I see that now, like with LaSalle, like, you know, mirroring to LaSalle, you guys are putting up some great schedules. Like that really is challenging. That like really pushes it forward. So it's really interesting to see, you know, yeah, or Drexel wasn't a good spot when you got there, but it was pushed to another level, right? And then now you're pushing another program to another level, and it just so happens to be, you know, in the same, uh, you know, city. Um, yeah. Any big races that come to mind on the collegiate side? And then um, I guess we're going to talk more about the coaching side, but I was going to ask you, you know, what advice would you give to a younger collegiate athlete? Uh, well, the big races that I did at Drexel, I think the biggest ones always at Charles. Vales was big. We went to iRace every year. Uh, my favorite, and I think I kind of mentioned it, was San Diego Crew Classic. I think it was 2016. Um, we we got there not really expecting anything because year before we actually did pretty poorly at San Diego Crew Classic. And so we uh, raced uh, Stanford in the final. I think Cal won. Uh, I don't know who got second, but I believe we got third and we did beat Stanford. We walked through them at the finish and that was probably the best uh race that i've done at drexel just the way the boat moved that day was out of this world and being able to row through an eight that you know at that time was top 10 in the country was miraculous almost that and that got us ranked 14th which i believe is still the highest that drexel's have been ranked and we held that for three weeks which was you know pretty pretty special for that time so yeah that's sweet and the, you know for it to be in the crew classic you know what i'm saying that's basically their home territory so for you guys to come all the way over from one side to the other to to get that you know to get that that squeak in man that's pretty yeah. good that's pretty good that, that, that was really big then um and then and advice to uh to uh, you said a uh, college uh athlete uh i think more so for freshmen really is what i say all, to all my guys now it's like Freshman year is 25% of your whole experience, right? Don't waste it. Don't wait for something. Just use it, right? We have a lot of times we have freshmen come in and say, well, I'm just a freshman. I shouldn't be doing this or that. I'm like, that's not really, you know, the case. I think you should be pushing your upperclassmen 
as much as you can and you should you know everybody deserves a spot just because of seniority doesn't matter right just do your best go go after it um and enjoy your time right i think that was my biggest thing i every single day i was grateful that i was in u.s rowing and i just enjoyed my time every single practice lane and not not every practice will be great but even if you get one percent better a day you're you're doing something great so i'm, I'm curious you're talking about how uh you came in and helped elevate the culture uh, at uh, Drexel. How how is uh, that implemented? What are the details on that? Huh. Uh, so I guess where do I start? And I don't know how much I want to really like go into details, but uh, yeah. I think when I came in, um, it would still, and, and this is kind of what I've noticed with, with LaSalle as well, um, when I took over, there's people that want to do well, but then there's the actions that you do. And I think uh, when I came in, a lot of the actions were contradicting the words, right? We would, we say we want to go fast, but we didn't want to practice twice a day. You know, we said we want to do this and that, but then we'd go out and party that weekend. I'm like, okay, well, if you really ascent, if you really want to ascend to the next level and do what you want to do, you have to sacrifice somewhere else. And I get it, it's college and I get it, it's you want to do all of these things, but when people say it's a privilege to be a division one athlete, it truly is, right? Now, being on the other side, being a coach, there are limited spots, right? And if you're awarded a spot to be in a team, somebody else wasn't, right? And then how are you going to take that time and what are you going to do to really leave your mark and change the team for the better? So that was really kind of my, as a captain on the team, my push, hey, let's really, if we say we want to do this, what are those actual steps that we are going to take to get to that point? instead of just saying it and then hoping it happens. Because my freshman year, we uh, we got fourth at Evels, which hurt a lot. You know, there was a lot of seniors that, that year that, you know, were crying. They, they obviously wanted to do a lot better, but they didn't. And I think I saw really early on the reasons of why that didn't happen. And I wanted to change it right away as soon as I could. So hopefully that answers that. Mm -hmm. No, I think it d definitely does. I mean, I had that same experience in uh, Jacksonville, man. Um, we were part of the foundation that you know what leads to this team right here but the culture was just out of whack it um 80 of the before my class came in 80 percent or 90 percent of the team had quit on jacksonville right so mm -hmm. our goal in there was like hey like we got recruited here we're thankful for our spot let's just work as hard as we can our freshman year and see where that gets us okay it got us there all right keep trying to build and then just just trying to change the culture from you know all talk and no action to you know putting in some action so um yeah. you know being a leader in that end um at drexel that, that's that's pretty impressive um what does life look like for you after graduation oh so uh i don't know how, how familiar with drexel but drexel has a co-op system uh program so i did uh three co-ops in my time at Drexel and my last two co-ops were with an engineering company, Burns Engineering. And then after I graduated, I ended up staying with them. Uh, so I worked as a systems engineer. Uh, so I did electrical engineering at Drexel. So I did uh, systems engineering uh, for Burns for four years after I graduated. And then I still kind of kept with rowing. So I volunteered for Drexel uh, for two years after I graduated. Then I volunteered with LaSalle for a year and then COVID hit. So then I kind of stopped with uh, coaching because there was really no coaching at that point. So I went into cycling. So I did a lot of cycling training, racing, et cetera. Um, and then I think, what was it, 2022, I want to say, uh, Bill Manning got a job at LaSalle. And I was like, you know what? I kind of want to go back into coaching. Here is this guy who obviously is, a, you know, a really good coach, right? One of the best coaches in U.S. Let me reach out and see if, you know, I can maybe volunteer and help out and maybe learn something from the guy. So I reached out to Bill. Uh, he ended up hiring me, uh, which was amazing uh, as an assistant. But then he left a week after that. <laughs> and then I took over. But uh uh no i'm grateful to bill for uh you know hiring me but also that's that's kind of how it was so i was i, was, I wasn't really a co coaching full-time for about four years and then i transitioned into it back into it a pretty impressive story there you know uh we just had a coach in the nba his name is joe mazula that's kind of what happened with him he was an assistant coach for for a minute and then you know his coach ended up leaving and then he ended up taking it up so um what number one uh what was the change? Did you uh, 
were you coaching uh, for LaSalle prior to COVID? And what was it like prior to COVID? So I coached so right after I, well, right before I graduated. So, so Drexel is a five-year school. I finished my four and I was done with my eligibility. So my fifth year at Drexel, I coached Drexel. Um, I believe that year I coached the 3V. Yeah, 3V8 that ended up winning Vales, which is cool. Then the year after that, I stayed um, at Drexel as a volunteer. Um, and then, I don't know if you remember, that was 2018. Um, I was actually given the four. Uh, they went to IRAs. Uh, there was Justin was in it. So, so I called Justin for that year, which was cool. Um, we ended up making the, the grand final in the four. Gold. Yeah, I always call it the unofficial gold, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. That, when the four was canceled? Yep. Uh-huh. That was that was tough, man. <laughs> that was the the worst probably thing that happened in uh, in my coaching career so far. <laughs> um, but that was a special boat. That was uh, we had uh, Lazar was one of our Serbian guys, uh, Justin, Doug, Davis, and and Dario was one of other creations. So uh, lightweight kid, uh, but they were moving well, man. That was a uh, you know I'm, I'm not gonna say Justin's four at Olympics was better, but I mean they they were moving well. I'll I'll tell you that they I think they uh, we had a practice one day. Um, we did a one k. And uh, they broke three in a in a coxed four, like they were wildly fast. Yeah, Corey, uh, so, I, I was gonna give you some context, man. They were wicked fast. And then the the final day, they cut most of racing. I think they got one like set of racing out, and then they cut it all the finals. And that team, bro, they were oh, they were speedy, man. It was so cool to see, man. Yeah. They were cooking, man. If you watch the 2018 IRA uh, replays, I think uh, you can watch the heats and semis. I think they won by seven or eight seconds. So it's like there's a shot where you watch the field and Drexel's gone. Like we, you don't see them. <laughs> that was that was cool to watch. That was cool to watch. Kind of still still a little salty about not racing the final, but you know it is what it is. I'll get there with LaSalle. So for sure, for sure. I mean, it's it's coming for, without a doubt. So um, yeah, so. You get into LaSalle, you were hired, you know, under, you know, Manning, and then you take over. What does that look like? What, what were your next steps there? Uh, well, uh, so I, I, feel, I felt like I knew rowing well enough to, to kind of be fine with that side. It was really learning the, I guess, when you leave mid-season or right before the season, recruiting really takes a hit. So it was really getting the the recruits back into the play, kind of talking to me and seeing if they want to come. So biggest you know amount of work was getting recruiting back to the to the stable spot, getting fundraising back because obviously your donors are now kind of like pissed off a little bit for sure. So and there's this new guy who nobody knows who he is taking over the team, right? And it was a really uncertain time for me as well because I quit my job to take to go back into coaching, which is a huge you know career risk and then at, at that time i know the school wanted to hire somebody else right there was you know obviously who is evo we have to look for a new coach whatever so luckily for me it was right before the season started so there was not enough time and, and at that time you know there was no coaches available really and if anybody was available in february i mean there was a reason they were so you didn't really want to rush the process so i was kind of given the green light to proceed and, and run the team for for the season which was awesome because we went on to have our best season ever um as as a team we um I switched the team so kind of like i'll kind of give you a little bit of a, a longer answer here so when i came in we, we started rowing and, and obviously the rowing to me wasn't at a, at a good spot and uh there wasn't really much time and i'm like if we go in and eight we're not going to improve our, our you know our power isn't at a level where it needs to be to really be competitive so doesn't really make sense to go and uh, do the eight this year. So I was like, okay, what is the smallest boat that we have? At that time, it was fours. Like we had four fours available to us. We didn't have any pairs or singles or, or anything back then. Uh, so I'm like, okay, let's get into fours. Let's split the team up and let's really focus this first year on technical development. Uh, so we spent that whole year in fours, really worked on technical side of rowing, really. Uh, obviously with proper structure training to get them in shape. And we ended up, pretty much winning every single race in a four that we raced um, with almost every four. Um, we had a lightweight four, freshman four, a JV four, and a varsity four. Um, to, so pretty much every single race we won in in 
all of those events. If not, we were second in some and then winning in some others. Uh, and then at Dead Vales, we had four boats entered, all four boats medaled with two gold medals, two silver medals. Uh, and then we ended up going to IRAs with the four who finished eighth that year, uh, our varsity four. So it's been, uh, you know, in terms of hardware, the, mo the best year LaSalle has had in over like 20 plus years. Uh, and it did really um, kind of set us up really well for what came after that, right? So now those guys had the technical background, learn how to row, learn how to win, which I think is a big thing in sports. To now where they last year, obviously they did really well, got second at Vales in the A. This year, again, second, you know, I was closer, uh, but it's slowly getting now to the point where we can fight, compete and be, and, you know, this is a new normal for us. It's not a, hey, we're just lucky to be here. We're just expected to be here now. So what's the initial reaction from, right, the donors, from support, from even the athletes, like from that initial season? Uh, massive, massive. I think uh, to put in perspective, we had our biggest fundraising year last year. We had our we have our biggest incoming class. We are bringing 16 kids, which is by far our biggest class ever. Uh, the amount of recruiting questionnaires I filled up uh, tripled this year compared to last year. So it's uh it's just exponentially been growing right and we also doubled our roster so when i came in we were at 20 guys coming into 2024 five we're going to be at 40. so uh it's uh growing on every aspect so it's, it's been fantastic that is amazing to hear that's amazing to hear um any notable races even if it's not like one of the bigger races that was like okay i really like how they like perform there any any boat that comes to mind Ooh, uh, a lot actually. I mean, that's a that's a that's a great question. I don't want to single out one, but uh, one of the first ones that was really special was uh, um, in that first year um, we were not planning on racing eights at all. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Bergen Cup, but Bergen Cup is Bergen Cup is pretty much a Philadelphia championships. So every Philly school except Penn enters and races Bergen Cup, uh, and so the guys came to me like three days before the race and we're begging me to jump in an eight and i was like all right we're gonna put a few our fastest fours and just race an eight you know because why why not you know what i mean and so we got the eight together and they were uh for the first 1k they were second right behind drexel in front of temple which for us was crazy and temple ended up passing us right we got third but we beat saint joe's we who we haven't beaten in like 10 years you know what i mean so that that was uh like okay so i'm like okay these guys are finally getting it <laughs> so it's working uh so that was a good race to, to really uh think about and then obviously i think 2023 uh, veils i think their varsity eight race was we were the whole year we were losing to drexel uh and i think the closest we ever got was about two seconds which is still pretty big in the eight uh but coming into the race you know we just you know everybody was ready to commit 100 percent and just go for it and uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you watched it, but, you know, coming in, getting even at a 1K and just really pushing them hard, almost taking the lead there. But just it was just like a, almost, it's almost like time stood still at that moment. I was like, oh, my God, let's go. And then we didn't have the sprint. So uh, it's, it's all good. But those are the two, two ones that are really um, come to mind. And then obviously this year, first race of the season against Drexel, we did end up beating them, uh, which was first for us, I think, ever probably in in 60 plus years so getting that one win against my my alma mater was uh was pretty special as well that's that's amazing man that's amazing so um don't we don't really talk about it too much uh because usually we're you know interviewing athletes on this side but um the the transfer portal ever come into play like does that help at all nowadays in rowing uh so Across the whole NCAA, it's getting massive, the transfer portal. Uh, it's not as big for rowing yet, but it does come into play. So for, and it does help a lot. So for us, we do uh, obviously try and recruit as much as we can in terms of transfers, obviously, if it makes sense for us and, uh, and the kid. Uh, we did get some really, I think, good transfers. Uh, we got a guy from Penn uh, who, was, who just graduated this year. Uh, so he was with us for two years. Uh, we got a guy from uh, Washington, uh, Marlon. I don't know if you've uh, met him. Uh, but he's a great kid, obviously a, a huge hammer on the erg and trying to get that translate to the water a little bit better. But he's a kid that you want on a team. He's a, you know, that, that guy that brings good attitude, mentality and really aggressiveness to practice. 
So we do use transfer portal. We do accept transfers. We, the school is very good with um, kind of taking as much credits, as many credits as possible to kind of help them come in and be eligible, which is which is a great thing. So we try our best to help wherever we can, even if it's a case where it's like, okay, this kid may not be eligible for the first year. We're willing to take that risk and help them get back to on track. And then obviously they can help us out whenever they're they're ready to to go. So technically, do you like reset them or do you just see where their level is at and then, you know, put them to somebody that's like or put them in a group that's like comparable to their like skill if they join? Oh, you mean like in terms of what shape they come in? Well, shape or like, you know, they might have a different rowing style. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? How do you how do you I see, gel I them in, I guess, is the question. Uh, I, I treat them same as freshmen in terms of like technical side. I think everybody the you just the thing with the uh, college rowing is everybody comes in with different things they've learned uh even if it's domestic only like different high schools teach widely different things sometimes so you try to just get them all on the same page as early as possible and so it doesn't matter if it's the kid came from a different college or high school or international we all try to just sit down go through whatever we want to see and how we want to row and drill that into them as, as early as we can so in terms of technical side i treat them pretty evenly um shape wise i've noticed that a lot of transfers come in in less of a shape because they might have taken time off they might have been cut from the team or whatever whatever happened uh so that's where we kind of take our time to really build them back up to speed and, and get them back into into full uh, full speed but or full training <laughs> training load but uh yeah it usually doesn't take that much time for us um, the biggest thing with transfers is just getting them eligible uh, so usually they will come in and i don't know how how familiar familiar you are but uh Credits don't always transfer 100%. Uh, so you got to make sure that NCAA and IRA rules are, are all followed and then they're eligible to actually compete. So that's the biggest challenge with transfers, getting them just um, eligible to race. Makes sense. Makes sense. So the second season, so after that first initial season, um, what was the, you know, what was your goals heading into that? Did you want to go back into bigger boats? Did you want to stay with the, the smaller boats? Um, what was your approach and then how did you execute it? Well, our, our goal was always to go back into the bigger boats. Uh, obviously, that's the only way you're going to get ranked and, and, and noticed uh, in the U.S., uh, which is fine. Uh, I think it's a good system. Uh, so our goal was always to come back into that. I think we've uh, kind of taken what we've learned the previous year and we got some pretty good freshmen that year as well to come in and really push the competitiveness of the team up. Uh, and I think it it worked it worked out really well. I think we right away from the from the day one. Uh, I think the guys remember that race that I told you about with Temple and Drexel and Joe's. Uh, so we kind of understood what the level needed is what what's the level needed to kind of be at that at that level or what's what's the speed needed. So we had clear goals in terms of hey, this is the erg average we need to hit in order to just be competitive, and we know we row well and we're gonna get to that point. Uh, so yeah, it was really just committing to the eight fully because it is a different uh, stroke a little bit in the eight than it is in a four, obviously. Uh, so committing to the eight, going through the fall season, building towards spring. We had a lot of difficult workouts in a fall that the guys remember <laughs> that were not fun, uh, but kind of building that base for that spring season to really carry us all the way through IRAs, which that was the first year that we made IRAs as a team. And that was pretty massive as well. What was the trip to Washington like? Uh, and had Drexel ever, or excuse me, had LaSalle ever been over there? Uh, no, LaSalle has never been there. Windermere Cup, that was, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I think so. Um, I don't know if you know Marcus Brown, uh, but Marcus was, uh, is we're going to be racing team? with him. You have? Oh, yeah, we're, so. we're going to be racing with him at the Charles. Oh, yeah. you will? Oh, yeah, awesome. me and Corey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. He's, uh, he's awesome. Uh, but he's a LaSalle grad. And he ended. It was coaching at UW at the time, uh, as an assistant coach. And one day he just calls me out of nowhere. We're just talking because he 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 calls me often just to talk about rowing, which is awesome. Uh, but so we we're talking about just I don't know something random, just probably something about the stroke. And then out of nowhere, uh, he mentions Windermere Cup, and I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be pretty cool because I raced there with Drexel when I was there my freshman year. And he goes, oh wait, Callahan's. Callahan's here. Let me just put you in a speakerphone. I was like, wait, what? And so I'm like, I felt like I'm like crashing this party of, of, of them just having their own little coaches thing there. But he put me in a speakerphone and Callahan was just like, yeah, why not? You guys should, you should come and race. So 
that's kind of how the whole thing started and then we ended up obviously traveling and racing there and uh the you know seattle is amazing city um the the race itself is a celebration of rowing it was really special to be there it, you know the cut going into the finish is amazing uh we uh did a start against the australian national team which was pretty funny and fun um in the race itself though uh it, we actually had a little crash with the western washington university uh so we kind of got little uh screwed there with that unfortunately but it is what it is we got third uh got a medal from windermere cup which is pretty pretty cool experience without a doubt without a doubt um so the next season i mean we're in these eights man you've, you've got some guys coming in from penn some from uw uh, and you know what's the team size like then you say you started with 20 now for this season it's going to 40 were you around like 30 or so yeah, so so first year we were at 20, then that second year when we were in the eights, we got up to, I believe, 28. Um, so didn't really go up to 30, but we were close. Uh, we had just enough for uh, two eights that year. And then last year uh, we had two eights and a four. So we slowly kind of building. We're building and now we really jumped up for this year. Um, sweet, sweet. So... Um... What are your, or I was going to ask you, what are some of your favorite, you know, rowing drills just in general? Oh, uh, I think so. Drills to me, uh, it depends what purpose you do them for. I think if you're doing for technical development, uh, obviously that's a different, uh, different way of looking at it. Or if you do them for just, uh, a lot of times when I do drills, I do it, I do it for, uh, the reason of getting the guys to think about what they're doing. Uh, so I think they like to do is, uh, three quarter pause that on a coxswain so you're pausing at three quarter slide your or handle is going to be at the rigger and then on a coxswain call you're going to square and then on a coxswain call you're going to take a stroke pause again so just so you pause stop think about where you are in space you don't see your blades right it's all all gone so you kind of got to imagine where the blade is kind of think about where the catch is coming up anticipate a little bit better I also have a drill I call a solid drill, um, which is a gunnel tap and a head tap at the same time. You might have seen it on our YouTube channel. We do it pretty often. Uh, it's for timing reasons, but also kind of to make you think, what am I doing with my hands? You know, what's going on in space? Uh, so a lot of my drills are just trying to think about what's going on and not ju don't just be like going through motions or just like, you know, hyper-focus on one thing. Just think about a little bit of, about what's going on around you that's very helpful for athletes you know Corey and i we both coach we coach on the younger side but that is very imperative to just have them you know think about what the the movements that they're making so uh pretty pretty cool to hear that pretty cool to hear that Especially i was gonna the say inside, you know because they they just think oh i want to move fast i want the both to move fast i move fast so they're just like going all over the place just rushing up yep yeah. yep yep and yeah, you know, it's funny because you see that in, in uh, you think college level is like, oh, they, they're, they're a lot better. But a lot of times when I'm coaching juniors and like kids, I'm like, man, my guys are exactly like this every day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. yeah. What type of uh, team culture are is, is establishing there at, at LaSalle? And like if uh, who, who would be an ideal candidate to, uh, you know, join the team? What, what, what would the ideal athlete look like? Oh, um, so I think asking coaches about team culture is always like, uh, oh, our team culture is the best. You know, who wouldn't say that? I think uh, if I would recommend to anybody that's looking at LaSalle, um, reach out to our guys, talk to the guys on the team, get to know them and ask about this, you know, about the culture and kind of how the team is. Because I think that's where really our team shines, right? I think we built something special where everybody loves to be here. Everybody wants to be here. Everybody's passionate about the sport and wants to push us to that next level. I think we have a unified goal. We're small enough team, big enough team, if you want to quote unquote, to have that ability to really be unified towards that one specific thing, which is awesome. Um, but our, our ideal recruit is somebody who really loves rowing. Like that's really the number one thing that I look at is like, you have to love the sport. You have to be willing to put in the work and just, enjoy the process right so we really are looking for the recruits that mesh well with our team currently and that are in that mindset of hey i love rowing i want to get better where, where what's the team that i can do that and also excel in academically and everything else that i want to do in in life
Uh, what has been your recruiting strategy so far? Are you looking domestically? Are you looking internationally? What's your strategy on that? And uh, you don't have to share too much, but, uh, you know. I, I mean, I don't mind. I think it's always funny when coaches try to be super secretive because, like, what am I going to do with that knowledge? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, no, we, we recruit from anywhere. I think uh, we have six internationals on the team now. We're getting two more next year, uh, which is always fun to have that experience coming in from – abroad and, and different perspective and rowing even you know it helps me as a coach you know i feel like I've, i learn a lot from these kids coming in and saying things that i might have never heard so that's that's cool for me as well uh but also domestically obviously i think uh american rowing is obviously growing and getting a lot better and i think there is a lot of potential with a lot of domestic kids to to, to step up to the next level so the way i kind of utilize uh international recruits is uh if you look at swimming for example it's like a little so I'm like diverting now. Um, a lot of swimming teams would bring international kids, but then kind of use that to make the domestic guys better, right? Because you're racing against those guys, you're always training with them, you kind of you're competitive with those already developed international swimmers. And I think in rowing, we I try to utilize the same kind of idea. So we bring in some very experienced international guys, but then we have a bunch of our domestic freshmen that can now look at that guy and absorb everything that they're doing within the same boat, next to them on the air, whatever it is, just trying to kind of accelerate their growth to that level, uh, which has been working up, working really well so far. And uh, what does your coaching look like uh, outside of uh, on the water? Like what, what is it on land? What are the uh, like the culture uh, guidance you're giving? Well, what, what does that look like? So on land, we're obviously all of the training is very structured. Uh, that's number one. The guys will get the training plan for the whole year ahead of time. Obviously, we'll change it and and adapt as we need as we go through stuff based on fatigue and other factors. Uh, so on land, it's pretty straightforward. Like we zone everybody. You know, you know exactly what splits, what power, what you should be doing at at any time. There is no questions about anything. Um, in terms of like technical stuff. We do look at some metrics in terms of like not just splits, but we look at power, stroke length, where actually do you peak in a stroke, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of things we do try and look at and incorporate into training to help the guys develop. In terms of on the water, um, I'm a big proponent of small boats and developing in small boats, getting then using that to kind of determine bigger boats. So we do a lot of that. Uh, we do a lot of not last year but we'll do a lot of uh this this year but we'll do kind of a, a lot of matrix racing in the fall especially on on weekends uh to really give them a good idea of where they stack up and where they need to improve going forward throughout the season uh i hope that answers it let me know if i didn't i don't know i forgot your full question there sorry well, that's good uh let's also hear a little bit of like how you guide your athletes to uh have that mentality or whatever uh uh you know competitiveness that you want from them how do you uh, encourage that I mean, that's, a, that's a good question i don't know if i can even answer that i think it's it's also how you as a coach what kind of attitude you bring to practice and kind of what you you know always teach and and push for i think for me it's always been that hey like you go easy when it's easy you go hard when it's hard and when you you know when you race that's that's what you got to show you know your best and uh yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to answer because I don't do anything special to bring in the competitiveness. I think that's really on guys and, and I think building the culture and, and explaining what you want and what you need to see out of them really brings the best out of them. And that's it's almost like they take into their own hands uh, of how they're going to achieve that. Uh, so I think as long as you have sit, set clear goals and standards, I think the guys will step up and almost like do it themselves if that makes sense. Right, right. So there's a lot of accountability to the individual athlete. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you. yeah. And I, I think it's really cool, especially when you were saying earlier about recruiting, right, for the internationals. I look at them as team boosters, right? That's the way that you kind of described them. And they come in, they they bring a little boost to the team. Um, it helps with the morale. But then also on the other end, on your side, the scheduling in terms of, like, who you're racing, you know what I'm saying? has changed to another level so it almost forces the full team from every boat from the smallest boat from the you know the freshman four all the way up right to to come up to another level so yep. i think just overall that's how the, the the team is just accelerated the way it is so i think it's just you know a lot of 
a lot of great things that came together for for the for the explorers to, to, to come up. So what are some of the goals that you have for the future of the program? Uh, I mean, there's a, you know, there's goals internally as coaches that we have, and that's obviously to, to be the best that we can, uh, to win, et cetera, this and that, that that's kind of like not a good goal to have. Right. I think you want to be more so when have the goals that you can control. I think for us, it's just maximizing every single day. And that's what I tell the guys all the time. It's, uh, you know, uh, I, no mediocrity, no BS, just come in with your best. And if that best is 80% today, just give me that 80%. You know, I don't, I don't really care what it is, but I want to see your best when you come in. And so if, if we can, if we can do that consistently, we'll be great. So it's just maximizing every single day, taking it step by step, uh, it is the main goal. And then obviously with, you know, as a coach, I want to see the guy succeed. And that's not just throwing that's also academically in, in life as a career, like, I want to see all of them be billionaires, successful, right? That way they can donate boats back to me. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, essentially I want to see them successful. And so whatever I can do to make that happen is what I'll do. Um, any observations that you have on, you know, the American system of like rowing and development on the younger side, on the youth side? Uh. I mean, I think it's been discussed in, in length with other people as well. And I think it's pretty known what may be lacking and what's what's different now. I think definitely the if you look at creation system and, and the fact that we are not allowed to sweep until we're 16, I think is good uh, just for injury prevention and for your development. Uh, I think uh, doing a lot of small boats and really focusing on that and not doing any bigger boats until later in life or in season is good. So I think some of the programs are seeing that um, and, and are going towards that. I know Royal America Rye, for example, is a hugely successful program, and I know they do a lot of things differently than, than some others. Uh, but obviously, as you can see now at Olympics, you have the four that's winning. So obviously something is is changing and, and it's going to towards the better better spot, I'd say. Without a doubt. Yeah. And I, and I just want to, I always ask that question just to just, you know, stress it. So, you know, a lot of people, we, t we talk about a lot in the wrong world, uh, just on the United States system, but yeah, I mean, we're showing, it, it's showing right now, right. It, there, there's an evolution to it. It'll get yeah. better. So um, I think in, uh, it's also on every level too. I think, you know, with Josie now being at the helm, I think he's doing some good things from, at least from what I've seen, trying to get a, at least a, some sort of a system where the, so a lot of times you'll have, sorry, I'm like losing my words, but when you're in college and you're trying to do national team, there is not a lot of information or it's hard to find. I mean, it is there on the website, but it's like, who can tell you? You have to go read it, read it yourself, find it. I think just having a system where, okay, here's uh, everything you need and that's communicated to college coaches. And then you can communicate to your athletes that, you know, you may have an American kid who's like Justin, right? Who is a, an amazing talent, just never really taught about doing a national team, didn't even know about it, right? Because there was just not no communication. I think that's number one, just getting that out there. Hey, like U23 team is an option. We want everybody to apply to go, even if not everybody's selected, just get a massive group of guys in there, see who's worth what, you know, and then start developing these like lists of guys that potentially could step up to the national, to the senior team at some point. But, you know, I think that's at the highest level, but also the lowest level then, you know, what are you doing for educating your high school coaches to really develop successful programs? Like how does that look like? What is the certifications that we have? Like, do we have that? You know, I think there's a lot of things that could change for better and that are slowly changing, at least what I'm what I'm seeing. Well, Corey, you got anything? I'll go ahead and say like Thank you for coming on. Uh, I guess uh, if I had one last question, I'd be uh, asking like when an athlete or a coach is really hitting a uh, you know series of events that's really uh, uh, testing them and their uh, love for the sport. What um, what what do you think is the best way to get out of that rut? Oh, like if you're you're getting a little burnt out potentially yeah, yeah burn out yeah uh uh that's a good one that's a good one uh i think just go back to basics i think for me i almost felt like that last year uh because i had to spend 
a lot of my time doing things other than just focusing on rowing, right? Because uh, that's kind of what happens in this role. But I think just going back to basics and, and trying to remember why I love the sport. And for me, that's just being on the water, you know, watching the shore or, you know, just looking at the boat and just enjoying the time, listening the flow for the flow, right? Just go back to those small things that made you fall in love with the sport at first. And it should come, bring you back to that good mind, you know, good mind space, right? That, that's at least what I would do. That's great. Ivo, thank you for your time, man. Thank you for telling your story. You know, where the program is today, we'll definitely be following. You know, we're fans here at Rowan Cast. And then I got I gotta gotta mention one thing here, okay? Especially while we're on, you know, on the podcast, okay. We have the ultra racing series, right? So it's to get people involved in the sport of rowing, um, who wouldn't normally get into the sport of rowing, but also add a little, you know, I'm a big fan of professional wrestling. So adding a little you know, a little entertainment to it. So you get to know who like someone is. is. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we're trying to develop a Philly relay race. It can, okay. It'll be a pre-recorded race. You can row for either, you know, LaSalle or Drexel, but we were trying to get all of the teams involved. Um, it could just be alumni based because I don't really want the athletes to really be like to do too much out of, you know, training. Yeah. But, you know, something that just brings, you know, the, the community together and, and amplifies the sport. So, you know, we really want to make this Philly showdown. So we're inviting you to be one of the first people, you know, you could rep any team you want. But uh, we're definitely shooting that invite out to you. And it, it won't be anything too fast. We're not looking for you to do a 2K or, you know, a 6K. But. Hey, I love it. I'm I'm all in. Uh, I'm, I'll have I have to let you know about which team I'll represent later. I don't know yet. I have to make that decision. <laughs> later but yeah i'm in i'm in sounds good sounds good well ivo we really appreciate your time man um let the people know where they can find you or where they can follow uh lasalle uh, i gotta say shout out to the lasalle coxon youtube channel i'm a big fan of that um so i had to give that shout out as well um but yeah how can people reach you um is there a recruiting uh questionnaire things like that yeah, our, our Instagram is LaSalle M Rowing. Uh, you can find us there. Uh, our questionnaire is in the bio. So if you're looking to row or, or want to are interested, you can fill that out. Uh, you can reach out to me directly on our website. Uh, my email is on the website if you go under coaches. Um, and then, yeah, LaSalle uh, Coxons is a great, it started off as just us trying to get some video for the guys to uh, to analyze after practice. And I've turned into this massive, uh, massive quote unquote. <laughs> uh channel where uh, people uh, love watching and you know the best thing about the um the youtube channel is sorry i'm like extending your show here is um we have all these kids from all over the place and i get a call from their parents almost weekly hey thank you so much for uploading i get to watch my kid row at work you know so that's the best part about the the youtube channel is we the parents can actually watch their kids row every single day uh so that's that's really something that's I think amazing and really a, a good thing that's coming out of it. Hey, that that's huge. That's huge because uh, you know my folks they only had a Facebook profile and it would be a parent taking photos of regatta and it would be a twenty second clip. So they don't know what you know they don't know what's really going on. But uh, you know showing my dad now recently like rowing and getting him into it and showing him like Olympic finals or you know or the Olympic finals just that just happened or just you know. Um, you know, World Cups, my dad's like, oh, I get it now. And he's like, dang, I really wish I could see some of the, you know, your races back in the day. So, yeah, I think that's amazing. So I think more programs should do that. I yeah, I would agree. love it, you know? I agree, I agree. Yeah, that's one thing I regret. I don't have a lot of videos of, of when I rode, which I'm like, well, now you guys will have too much. So you can always show your kids when you're when you're older, so. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate you for your time, Coach. Um, yeah, we're very thankful. We uh, thank you for bringing your time, Corey. You got anything? Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, coming on. It was a pleasure, and I uh, hope to see you around. Of course, thank you, guys, and uh, best of luck at uh, you racing at Charles right this year. Mm -hmm. Good luck at yep. Charles, yep. and yeah, if uh, I'll be happy to do this anytime again. So just let me know. I'll be more responsive on Instagram. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all good. All good. Don't sweat it. <laughs> Peace out, everybody.